Hey, welcome to another Women Lead webinar series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Michelle Burquist, your humble moderator today, as we're delighted to bring yet another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Our Women Lead webinars are designed for you as the professional leader in business, whether you're an aspiring female leader or a woman leading people or projects, teams, or even a company or business. Our goal is to select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. Our webinars are just shy of one hour, and at the half hour mark, we'll be answering any questions that you've submitted online during the presentation portion of our webinar. So for today, I'm delighted that the title of our webinar is Her Wealth Journey, Empowering Women for Financial Success. And it's my absolute delight to introduce our thought leader today, and introducing and speaking to us is Tanya Torres. And Tanya is not only a financial planner, but Tanya is the owner of a business that's called the Power Plan Planner. And Tanya is going to be sharing with us so much great information. But just let me tell you a little bit about Tanya is that not only is she a certified plan, plan, financial planner, but at a young age, which you will see, she's very bright, she's intelligent, and oh my gosh, she's made her mark in the finance industry among all of her peers, much her senior. And you're gonna hear more about her resilience that was born well before navigating the male dominated arena on Wall Street. Um, basically in a nutshell, which I'm excited to hear what Tanya has to share with us, is that she's gonna really talk to you about how she wants to help individuals to help them use their money in a way that they can create a life that they love and feel fulfilled to live. So she lives by the mantra that finance is more than numbers, which I totally agree. And she helps others achieve goals, gain clarity and live life purposely. Without further ado, Tanya, big welcome and applause to Women Lead webinars. And you, my dear, have the floor, so to speak. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate that intro. As Michelle said, my name is Tanya Torres. I am a certified financial planner. If you are here today, it's probably for one of a few reasons. Number one, you maybe already have an advisor and you're wondering if um, maybe there's some room for improvement. Two, you don't have an advisor and you want to learn more about what it means to work with one or what to expect on your end. Or three, you really have no idea what's going on with your money. <laughs> Whatever reason that you decided to join, I promise you that you will be glad that you did. And the first step is always just taking initiative and showing up. So whether you decide to take the information and run with it or actually implement it and be proactive with your finance with your finances. That is completely up to you. My goal here is to provide you guidance and information and hopefully some motivation to you as a woman to take charge of your financial life and of your wealth journey. So um, a little bit about me. I am a certified financial planner, as I have mentioned. So basically what that means is that I have gone through the full curriculum and have met all the requirements to become certified. And that includes a bachelor's degree, four years of active experience servicing clients as an advisor in the financial industry. It also includes the passing of six courses, which are general finance, investments, retirement planning, um, estate planning, tax planning, insurance. Um, so I am very knowledgeable and very aware of what goes on behind the scenes in terms of what it means to really take control of your full finances. I have worked as an advisor now for six years. I began my career at Merrill Lynch and I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to work there. I always make the joke that I was hired at Merrill to cross off the Latina and the female <laughs> box in their diversity diversity and, exclu and inclusion. Uh, ratios and numbers. Um, but for whatever reason, I took the opportunity and I ran with it. I, go. While I was at Merrill, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of high net worth families and individuals. I actually didn't really know what wealth management was until I got to Merrill. And I it opened my eyes to a whole new world and a whole new idea of what it meant to be financially secure. 
Um, at Merrill, I specialized in investment management, meaning a lot of my job was overseeing portfolios, rebalancing, creating investment strategies for businesses, individuals, and families based off their goals. And I got to the point where I realized that, hey, the knowledge that I know and all the resources that I can offer are something that I would like to do on my own terms. Merrill being a big Wall Street firm did have a lot of regulation and oversight in terms of what I could do as an advisor and who I could serve as clients. If you didn't have a million dollars, I couldn't bring you on as a client. So I am now an independent advisor and I decide who to work with and how I want to structure my practice, which is really the reason why I decided to put on this webinar because through my experience, I've learned how important it is to have a financial plan and to, as a woman in Wall Street and in an industry that is flooded by men, I realized how much women need this more than anything. And a little statistic is I represent 29, one of the 29% of the female financial advisors in wow. the industry. So that statistic is still very, very low. While there has been a lot of improvement in recent years, still very, very low. Of that 29% female advisors, only 23% are CFPs. So I am very proud and happy of what I've done in my career. But now really what I want to do is give back and if I can help you in some way, that's what I'm here to do. Love it. I'm, I'm going to tell you, your credentials scare me. Like that's a lot <laughs> of education. So I, for everybody thought, that like scares me just from a call. You know, after I took the CFP exam, which by the way is a six hour exam, I swore never again. This is the last credentials I'm getting. <laughs> um, I'm not doing anything else. But of course, I am looking into a becoming an enrolled agent on the tax side. But we'll wow. see. But um, I did want to share these statistics that I found in doing research that I believe are very alarming um, and that should hopefully motivate you to take charge. So 59% of women are making household financial decisions, which means that the majority of women are making these decisions. So that's a good start. The problem is that I see is that a lot of women that are making financial decisions don't have the knowledge or the resource to make the decisions that will lead to an improvement or for the better future of them and their families. 60% of women describe themselves as being financially independent. Again, great numbers, right? But you need the knowledge and you need the guidance to assure you that you are on the right path. Now, these are the numbers where hopefully we can change that. And that's why we're here today to hopefully change that. 68% of women have never met with a financial advisor or an accountant. Okay, me, that's that, shocking. That is shocking. Yeah, and these are numbers based out of a 2023 study. So they are very, very recent numbers. To me, I think what I saw and what I've seen in my experience is that a lot of women don't feel comfortable when it comes to seeking advice from male advisors. There is very different dynamics, not to say that male advisors don't know how to do their job or don't do their job correctly. There's just a different thinking. There's just a different mentality that women have when it comes to money and versus what men have. And I saw it very often because I would very often see that the male was the one making all the decisions, knew all, all about the investments and the wife just kind of, knew where the money was and that was about it. The problem here is that from my experience as well and in, in dealing with a lot of male advisors is that they didn't understand that women are wired differently. Men look for high returns and making sure that they're making as much money as possible and that their money is making more money. And women have a little bit more of that nurture um, instinct. They want to make sure that their family is taken care of, that they're going to be okay, that their parents are okay, that the kids will be okay. So the dynamic, the conversations, the topics of interest are just very different. So I think that's one of the reasons why people, why women don't seek an advisor because they don't feel listened to or heard and they don't feel understood. And that's mainly just because like the book says, um, women are from, men are from Mars, women yeah. are or something like that. That's true. Um, I read and that book. 
The last statistic is 57% of women are not actively investing, which to me is also extremely alarming because it's great to have a high income to manage your money in a way that you're not living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. But the reality is, is that if you really want to take care of yourself financially now and in the long term, or make sure that your family is looked after, you need to be investing. Yeah. So like I said, hopefully after today, it'll give you a little bit of guidance in terms of how to start, where to start and what to look for. So Tanya, let's- can I ask you, do you find that women, I know you said what some of the challenges are, but do you find that um, a lot of women, one, just are fearful that they don't know the right questions to ask and they don't want to be embarrassed? Or is it that they just, they don't really feel comfortable with the advisor client role, you know, whether it's a man or a woman? I'm just curious what you see as some of the biggest challenges women face and why these stats are like this. I think it's both. I think one, they don't know what they don't know. And women tend to be of that characteristic where they know that they don't know something and they're afraid to ask because they don't want to look foolish or sound dumb. Men don't care. Men will ask what they want to ask yeah. and don't care how they sound. I think so. I think that plays a role like that self-confidence, that um, that internal makeup plays a role. And I also feel that Sometimes the women have talked to advisors or have heard stories of advisors and they would rather just not deal with it. And they don't feel that even, or because of a bad experience, they don't feel that there is an advisor out there that understands. Um, but you know, on the bright side, there's a lot of advisors. So one of the things is making sure that whoever you work with, that they you feel heard, that you feel understood and that there's trust. And I think that goes a long way in making and us changing these numbers here. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. All right. Awesome. So as I was saying, as uh, if the numbers that I mentioned aren't reason enough for you to take charge of your financial future, here's another couple numbers that will hopefully make you care and will make you understand why you should care. So in the upcoming years, women in the United States are positioned to capture a significant amount of money in motion. And money in motion is referring to retiring. So 401ks are being moved, 403bs are being moved, parents are dying. So a lot of inheritances are coming into women's hands Um, or just business interests. Businesses are being liquidated and there's an interest that belongs to the woman. And now that lump sum of money is just landing in your lap. Um, So, Another thing to consider is that women have a a higher life expectancy compared to men. So you have to take into consideration that even if you decide to retire at 65 or 67, you could very well live until through your 90s. So how do you position your investments to make sure that you don't run the risk of running out of money, right? And also in the next couple of years, um, women are making, are set to be making more financial decisions. So there's a 30% increase over the past five years in married women making financial household decisions. So gone are the days where men are in charge and they do everything and women just do nothing, right? The, these gender roles are slowly dissipating. And I think for good reason, and I think for a good cause also. So Another thing that I saw that was very, very common was when a husband or a spouse passed, the women decided to go find a different advisor. And that was because they were not involved or did not have a relationship with their current advisor like the husband did. So there is that stat says 70% of women who change advisors with the, there's 70% of women change advisors within one year of their spouse dying. So what I recommend to you now is that if you and your spouse do have an advisor, be involved. You, your advisor should be encouraging you both to attend the meetings because the money belongs to both of you. Or two, don't be afraid to ask questions. You're paying that person, that advisor to guide you, to help you, to help you understand, to answer your questions. If you knew what you were doing, you wouldn't have an advisor. So there's no 
sense of shame or there should be no embarrassment or shyness in being proactive with your advisor, getting to know them, building a relationship because with death or with divorce, there's a lot of grief. So to think of you having to deal with that grief, with that loss, and then to still have to be worried about finding another advisor to make sure that you're okay financially, these are just things that we want to stay ahead of. And I saw that very, very often at Merrill, where we had a household that was husband and wife. Husband was the one that was very, very involved. Advisors did, the advisor didn't do much to involve the wife. So when husband passed away, wife took the money and found an advisor that they liked. So I think that it's in your best interest to be involved, to ask questions and to know what's happening, how it's happening and what role you play. Do you, Tanya, do you find with women, like what are some of the biggest financial mistakes you see women make? I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, elaborate on mistakes, but some of the questions coming in are like, how do I know what I don't know? I mean, those are, those are interesting, but what kind of, you know, missteps do you see women make the most when it comes to their financial plan? No, by far the biggest mistake I see is doing nothing. Uh, A lot of women go through the motions of their career and they find ways to make more money. They are even maybe proactive with their budgeting and their saving, but it stops there and they do nothing else and they seek no guidance. So I think that is the biggest difference in the characteristics that I see of male investors versus women investors is that women are not proactive in terms of what can I do or how do I do it? Or where are these resources? Um, So yeah, doing nothing is more costly than doing anything at all. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I I see it too. Women and women are concerned. They don't want to feel, that's kind of like going into a doctor, like, you know, we should, but we should ask questions. And I see women just not, they don't know the questions. I mean, one, they made me feel embarrassed because they're asking Mm -hmm. questions because it's about how we live our lives, how we spend and make money. And I see a lot of women that just go, yeah, I'm just not going to ask, which I think is, that's too bad. That's, that's, and and part of that goes back to the advisor, the client advisor relationship. If your advisor doesn't make you feel comfortable enough to ask questions, as dumb as you may think they are, then maybe that's why you're not asking, right? There's a lot of factors that play into that. But yeah, more than anything, it's just the doing nothing can be very hurtful as to your wealth and to your finances. I think that's a good point. It's all about, you know, good fit personality wise too, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Make Absolutely. That so in an effort to help you, here are three things that you can do today to better your financial situation. The first one is know where you are now. The second one is to clearly define your goals. And the third one is to set up a meeting with a financial advisor. These are three things that cost you nothing and that will give you a lot of clarity and make you feel really empowered. I think with money, there's this sense of lack of empowerment and it's not until and a lot of it comes from avoidance people avoiding their finances only make things worse and it's not till you actually sit down and look at where you are what's coming in what's going out where what are you working towards what are some of your financial goals or that you seek the expert advice that things become clear and all of a sudden you feel motivated because you have goals to work towards you have a person that you can confide in and trust with your money. And you know exactly what is happening now. So as I mentioned, number one is to know where you are now. With a financial plan, we need a starting point. With all planning that is involved, this is the one of the biggest things that I see that people lack is that they don't know what is happening. And like I said, this costs you nothing but know your starting point. So here are a few things that you can do. Sit down, take last month's bank statements, print out investment account statements, and just see where you are. So how much money is coming in? What's your monthly income? Whether that be from a job or from a rental property or business interest, wherever the income is coming in, know how much of it is coming in. 
also know how much of it is going out, whether that be for mortgage, for bills, spending, eating out, however the money is going out, you should know also how much of that is going out. If you have any debts, you should know how much you owe. In addition to that, you should know what the interest is that you're paying on these debts because that should help you prioritize. Do I need to take care of this debt immediately or am I okay prolonging it and paying it off over time given the interest rate? Do you recommend, and, Tanya, that people do it by month for the whole year? I mean, is a, is a month kind of like a better kind of viewpoint for them to know monthly? I think monthly is a very, very good starting point because for the most part, recurring bills and subscriptions tend to be paid monthly and also income usually comes in monthly. Um, so, or on a monthly basis. So even if you get paid bi-weekly, you know, with one pay stub, you double it. Um, so I think it's there, the numbers are easier to calculate, but it gives you a good idea of where you are now um, and and what you're a- actively doing. Another, another common mistake that I see or um, with clients is that they don't know, people don't know how much they're saving or investing. They just, they say, oh, I know I'm participating in my 401k. I don't know how much. Or yeah, I've moved, I have some in savings. Um, I haven't put some in a few months or yeah, I do it every two weeks. So these are all good starting points because they give you areas of improvement. So what gets measured can get improved. If you're not measuring, it's hard to improve. And this is a starting point that I do with all clients. I, with our first meeting, after we've decided to work together, we, we've, in order for me to create a financial plan for you, I need to know where you are now. Where are we starting from, right? With every plan, you have to have a starting point. And like I said, print out some statements. If you don't know how much money is going out, take a highlighter and just highlight all these expenses that you're doing from last month's bank statements. 95% of clients that I work with, I bring the highlighter to the meeting. I say, you bring your statement, you print it. I'll bring the highlighter. I don't tell them that I'm bringing the highlighter. And then when I ask, okay, let's talk about expenses. Okay, we go through mortgage, utilities. Okay, well, how much money do you guys spend eating out or shopping? Oh, not that much. Okay, well, let me see your bank statement. Okay, here's a highlighter. Highlight every transaction. And the eyes are like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I spent that much eating out. Or I didn't realize that I spent that much at Target or at Amazon, whatever it is. And it's not to feel embarrassed or ashamed of your spending habits. It's just to bring awareness. Do you, Tanya, do you, this is a question from uh, Susan. She said, what tools do you use? I mean, you said highlighter, but are there any sort of apps or easy kind of like expense and income besides like say QuickBooks for businesses, but Mm -hmm. are there any little kind of cool apps or things that you would recommend for people to calculate all this? No, actually, I think that the biggest psychological effect comes from doing this manually. And from actually sitting down old school with a highlighter and a pen and your printed statements, because it just brings awareness, number one, to what your spending habits are or what your other habits are. And number two, it gets rid of that anxiety or of that fear of actually sitting down and looking at your finances. And this is not something that you have to do every month, but it's good to know at all times, what these numbers are. They're your numbers. It's your money that's moving in and out back and forth, right? So I think you can do it once and then figure out where you are. And then if you wanted to do it periodically, that's also a good habit. Um, But for the most part, I don't believe that counting every dollar, whether that be in an app or a spreadsheet, I don't think that's effective. For the most part, you want to automate your finances as much as you can, but this is a good way to start. Okay, cool. All right. So number two is clearly define your goals. So just like you need a starting point, you also need an ending point. So what are you working towards? This is also something that I see that is very, very common with clients. There is no clarity around goals. The number one lack of clarity or the number one question that I ask that always, always has lack of clarity is, when do you want to retire and how much money do you need to survive every year in retirement? That's something that people don't think about. They think I just need to get to retirement. No, you have to live through retirement, which is a whole 
different thing, <laughs> right? But having clarity on your goals, it's what's going to help you, number one, be motivated. Now you have something that you're working towards. Don't think of retirement as something that you're you're retiring from. I don't want to work anymore. I hate this job. I don't want to do this anymore. What are you working towards? That sheds light in a much more positive and motivational way, I feel. And your goals are something that can be something as far as retirement, or it can be something that you want to do along the way. Maybe you want to purchase an investment property in a few years. Maybe you want to buy a boat in three years, right? This is also going to help you determine or help your advisor determine what your investment strategies should be and what accounts they should go in. How different are the, Tanya, how different are the goals from, let's say a small business owner versus somebody who's working for a company as a career? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thinking W-2 income versus a business owner that's building their company. Do people... Like, I think this is such a nebulous question. Do people usually come in and say, this is my, this is what I want. I want a vacation home in the Bahamas and that's what I'm striving for. Or do they, are they kind of nebulous a little bit? No, people come in and say things like, and, and I kid you not, this is 99% of people that I start, that I work with. They say, well, I want to retire and I want to travel when I retire. Wow. And I'm like, okay, well, that's a good start, but let's quantify it a little bit more. How much money do you need to retire? Are you okay living off of $5,000 a month, right? That puts you at $60,000 a year. And when you say travel, where do you want to travel? How often? So if you want to take one international trip a year, okay, so maybe we can do that with $6,000 a year. And now we can plan for it, right? Yeah. So these are very, very common answers that I hear. But people don't think in, in any other in any more detail they, besides just retire and travel. But when I start asking these questions, I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. That's OK. That's my job to ask you the questions that you never thought about. <laughs> right. But another thing with having clear, clearly defined goals is, you know, when enough is enough. When if you tell me that you need seventy five thousand dollars a year to retire and we're looking at all of your accounts and your investments, and you get to the point where I tell you, hey, it looks like if you stop putting in any money tomorrow, you could live through retirement with $75,000 a year. That is something that I've told clients before. And it's like, well, how do you know that? I'm basing it off the information you told me. So if you do want to live off $75,000 a year, I'm showing you that, that based off my analysis and the numbers that I'm writing in your financial plan, you're there already. So I think it's also good because that's how you know when enough is enough. And I always, another question that I get all the time is, well, what do most people say? So what's relative? Some people are okay with a hundred thousand dollars a year. Some people say, no, that's too much. What am I going to spend on? Some people need way more. Some people need less. It's relative to the life that you want to live in retirement. Or maybe it's not retirement that we're working towards. Maybe we're building a real estate portfolio. I also have younger clients that say, well, retirement seems like such a, a long time from now, right? That's something that I get with a lot of younger clients. But again, it's all about education and just having goals that we're working towards. More than anything, it's the peace of mind that no matter what happens, we can go back to the numbers, go back to the goals and say, hey, even though the market went down 20% last year, you're still on track. Hey, even though you are experiencing X, Y, Z and you can't work for the next six months, that's okay. Your numbers are still okay. It's peace of mind more than anything. Yeah, great. And the last thing that you can do today to better your financial situation, set up a meeting with a financial advisor. One of the biggest, and as we've talked about, Michelle, is with women, there's a lot of anxiety around working with advisors and for a lot of reasons, right? But one thing that I will tell you, people don't hire me as an advisor because they know everything and because they don't need anything from me. People come to us for guidance. They don't know anything about finance. If they did, they wouldn't be hiring me, right? Right. So that's something to just keep in mind as you are thinking about this. When you call a mechanic, if you knew how to fix your car, you wouldn't call a mechanic. You just do it yourself, right? So it's the same concept. 
that's what we are here for, to provide guidance, to provide knowledge, and to make sure that your financial plan and that financial planning for you intersects with your money and your life and your goals and your values, right? Uh, another thing, another reason why you should consider setting up a meeting with a financial advisor, even if you are very savvy, is because one of the things that I've seen is that money is very emotional and your emotions and your behaviors can make you or break you financially. Now, this can be something like spending habits where you're spending too much, or it can be something where maybe you're not a super sophisticated investor and seeing a pullback or the market crash makes you super anxious. So you take all of your money out of the market. These are the repercussions that these emotional decisions can have on your wealth building journey are, I can't even quantify. So another reason to seek that guidance is because for us, the right for the right financial advisor, it's not just going to be about looking at the numbers and showing you graphs and charts and analysis. It's going to be talking you through how does money make you feel? How was your upbringing with money? Maybe you have a bad relationship with money. You don't even realize it. I use myself as an example all the time. I grew up in a very low socioeconomic family and community. My mom, bless her heart, I love her, but to this day, she is one of the worst people when it comes to money because she just has that scarcity mindset. She is counting every penny. She's always worried that her money's going to run out. She tries to save on everything. Um, she counts how much it costs, how much she would save if she bought Charmin versus generic toilet paper. I mean, crazy, <laughs> crazy. And she's okay. She just, and it, it was something that she learned from her mom and that she can't shake it. I didn't realize that subconsciously I had a lot of those thoughts running through my head until I got married and I was constantly looking at price tags or looking at what a meal would cost and opting to say no to the large or passing on an appetizer and it marrying somebody that had a completely different upbringing and mindset was what brought light to me it was like wow like why don't you why aren't you counting every dollar I was like well we don't need to count every dollar like <laughs> an appetite a ten dollar appetizer is, is not going to break us and I'm like you're right so a lot of these relationships and emotions and behaviors that you may not even be conscious that you practice or that you have on a daily basis are something that an advisor can help you work through. And last reason is because financial literacy is the best thing that you can do for yourself and for your family. If you are somebody that has wealth already, that whether that's a $10,000 portfolio or a $1 million portfolio and something is set to be passed on to your kids or your grandkids or nieces or nephews, whatever it is, think about it. If you were 18 or even 25 and somebody handed you $50,000, $10,000, I guarantee you would be gone in an instant. So one of the best things that I like to do as an advisor is to involve uh, beneficiaries and to involve the family and teach, start kids, start, whether that's children, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, and have them join in on the conversation and understand what it means to invest, what it means to save, how you can be better and then teach them that literacy so that whatever money that you want to hand off as a legacy for yourself is being handed off, not just into it's being handed off without nothing at all, but also into the hands of somebody that has that knowledge and that has that literacy to grow it and to do something meaningful with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, when quote that I live by is good advice doesn't need to be expensive, but bad advice will cost you dearly, no matter how little you pay for it. <laughs> so something to keep that. in mind. I like that. And if you have made it this far into the webinar, thank you so much as a token of appreciation. You can use a QR code on the screen to create a, an Elements account. Elements is an app that is available to the public only through financial advisors. And basically what the app does, it's gonna prompt you to create an account and then you're gonna be able to 
um, input all of your information, your income, your debts, your insurance information, your accounts. And Elements is going to give me a scorecard of what your current financial health is. So think of it like your vital signs from a doctor's office. So this way I can help you in terms of seeing how you're doing financially and see if there's any room for improvement. Or maybe this is going to show you that, hey, you are on the right track rock star keep going right whatever way whatever whatever it shows us i will gladly provide you a complimentary financial assessment from the information that you put in and we will go from there like i said if there's any room for improvement i will gladly tell you that if you are doing amazing i will cheer you on and gladly tell you that as well but it is a good way for you to see how you're doing financially if there's any room for improvements on or what your progress are progress is towards your goals. Awesome. I just I just scanned the link. It worked great. Awesome. <laughs> and that okay. is it. Well, we got quite a few questions, girls. So first of all, applause. <clears throat> I should have that as a sound effect on here for everybody. <laughs> you know what? Some of the questions that came in, Tanya, like this was one. You used the term this is um somebody said the wealth management versus financial planning what's the difference or is there a difference like i hear i hear those terms too where people go i'm a wealth manager somebody mm -hmm. else says i'm a financial advisor is there a difference on those different terms cuz yes so yes there is a difference um wealth management is what i was doing at merrill and it's very much focused on just investments it is quite literally the managing of wealth that is something that you hear as a service provided usually by advisors at bigger firms like Merrill or UBS or Chase or Wells Fargo. And it is, and while it is very beneficial if you do have a lump sum of money, usually there's other requirements to meet on the firms and like an asset minimum or, or a net worth minimum. And the whole focus is just investment management. There is some planning involved, but it's not a full plan that includes everything like a financial planner would do, which would be an, an literally putting everything on the table from budgeting and debt all the way to taxes and estate planning. So that's the difference. Gotcha. Here's another question from somebody and they said, what, um, oh gosh, that's a lot. Okay. I've worked with financial advisors in the past, had a plan. It seems like everybody puts me into a but the same bucket. Like I'm curious, I, I'm her, I guess her question is, how is are you different or if each financial advisor? Because uh, to me, oh, and then she said, oh, I'm I'm usually put into a 60-40 plan allocation. Like, is there a difference with who you put your dollars with? Or I I don't really get the question, but that's what somebody said. So again, these are all questions where. You're, you shouldn't walk away from your investments or your meeting with your financial advisor and not have full clarity on what is being done with your money and why. So the way I can't speak for why your money is set up that way, but what I can tell you is how I go about finding investment strategies for my clients and how I've heard a lot of great advisors do it. And it's there's a reason why today I mentioned that having clarity on your goals is absolutely one of the most important things that you can do because it gives me number one, a timeline in terms of what investments I can select and also getting to know you as a client makes me, helps me understand what risk you're comfortable taking. So those are the two factors that are driving the investment strategy at all times so, and, and number three, it should be that you should have full clarity and understanding on why you're being invested into that type of strategy or portfolio. I, in a perfect world, it should align with your goals and your timeline for whatever goal it is that you're investing for, whether that's a short-term goal or a long-term goal, but that's really how I can answer that question. Yeah, it was a little without more context. <laughs> I think that hopefully they'll scan the code. So why don't you go back to your scan the code slide? Because I have a couple more questions from people in our time. Like, yes. what's, the, what's your process like to go through and help somebody put a financial plan together? I, I know because I know you really well and I want our viewers to know like you have this beautiful book. Do you have a copy of your power planner with you? I do. Yes. I'm like, how do they get that gem? Because that 
is a gold. That is amazing to go through. Yes. That. So this, the power planner is available on www.powerplanningco.com. Powerplanningco.com. Yes. Just making sure. Okay. Co.com. Yes. Um, this is a great tool that it was is custom created by me. If you are more of the do-it-yourself investor, do-it-yourself um, finance person, this is a great tool to help you with um, to answer your question in terms of what to expect or what that financial planning process is like is one, it's a process and two, it's an ongoing one. So typically it starts with a meeting where um, I call it the discovery meeting. And during this time, we put everything on the table. So we find out exactly where you are now what's coming in, what's going out, where is it going and why. And we also get clarity on the goals. So that is meeting number one. That helps me determine a starting point, an ending point and what I have to work with, right? Because if you have more money coming in and then going out, then you have a surplus of cash at the end of every month. That cash is used to allocate towards your goals. So I take all that information back with me from that meeting. I create a financial plan and recommendations based off where you're starting from and where you want to be. And I say, okay, Michelle, this is where you are now. This is how much you, this is your current net worth. This is what you have in cash flow. And I think that based off what you told me you want to accomplish, we should put X amount of money here. X amount of money into this account. And then these are the investment strategies that I've created for you. And again, are based off your time horizon for the goals and the risk that you're comfortable taking. And then after that is done, um, and that also includes right tax strategies and estate planning is a whole different meeting. Um, but if there's a need for life insurance that is also addressed, everything gets addressed. Um, after that, if you are okay as a client with the recommendations that I'm making, um, we will proceed with opening accounts, moving money, starting to fund. If you're not okay with the recommendations I'm making, I go back and I create new ones or I adjust them based off what you're telling me that you would prefer to see or want to see maybe goals change or something change. And then we would just meet periodically throughout the year. I like to meet with clients once a quarter just to check in see how things are going, see if anything's changed on your on your end, or if maybe I need to update you on how the markets are doing, um, investments or anything like that. Um, and, and that's it, really. It's an ongoing relationship. I tell people all the time, your financial plan that we create right now is likely going to change, right? Because life happens. As things change, your plan change. Maybe you'll inherit a large lump sum of money. Maybe something will happen to you where there's no income coming in, right? And we just adjust as life comes. And your plan, it's more, it's not really a financial plan. It's more like ongoing planning all the time. I like that life planning. Well, you know, and, and this is, some people know, some people don't. So for our viewers and our, our you know, kind of like attendees, like what what's the difference between a fee-based advisor, which I think you are, right? Because you charge fees, but then also other financial advisors say they do it for free, but you're paying fees with your investment account. So I'm not, can you share that with our attendees? What's the difference between the two? Absolutely. So a, a financial plan is something that you pay a fee for. So that is usually a fixed annual fee that you pay to get a full financial plan. You can decide if you want to implement it on your own and you open the accounts that were recommended and you oversee the investments. Or if you want your advisor to oversee the investments, there is what's called an asset under management fee. The standard industry rate is 1%. So how that works is that your advisor gets paid 1% per year of the assets that are being managed. So if you give your advisor $10,000 to manage, um, that advisor would get paid $100 per year in addition to the fixed financial plan fee. Um, so that, that's the difference between fee-based and, and typically those are the two ways that advisor gets paid. I also get paid commissions from any life insurance policies I issue, um, but that's only done if there's a need, if we uncover that there's a need for life insurance. But typically those are the three ways that advisors get paid. Advisors that do more wealth management only do the asset under management fee, but they look for 
higher, they have usually account minimum. So they'll create a free financial plan for you, which is basically like an investment strategy for the assets that you have. And they'll roll them over under their management and they'll start managing at 1% and start getting paid from that. So the different, the reason why they offer it for free is because obviously getting paid 1% from a $25,000 account for 1% from a $2.5 million account, the fee is much higher. Um, there's a lot of ongoing debate of whether advisors should have charge an AUM fee or what that means for clients. I think honestly, if you find value in having somebody else managing your investments and you understand how your money is being invested, then I think there's no shame in paying an AUM fee. If you prefer to be more hands-on and do everything on your own, again, do it on your own. It's really what makes more sense for you. At Merrill, I had a lot of clients that had, a, you know, million dollars, multi-million dollar accounts, and they were paying that 1% fee. And I had one particular client that his response to me sticks in my head all the time. I created an investment strategy for him. And I, as I was explaining it to him, he said, would you put your money in this investment strategy? And Ooh. I was like, well, I don't have $10 million, but if I did, absolutely. Yeah. I, I said, absolutely. I, I created it. Like I absolutely believe in it. He's like, okay, then that's all I need to know. This helps me understand what you're doing with my money so that I can go back to my job and just focus on making more money. So it, the dollars that I'm paying you guys are worth every penny because it frees up my time and my mindset and my peace of mind to be able to focus on just making more money. There's a reason why I outsource to you guys. And I thought, wow, what a what an interesting frame. Yeah, right? very much. Well, mm -hmm. And you know, and so here's another question. Somebody said, so do you you actually once you create the plan, then do you manage the account as well for somebody or does somebody else do that for you? I do give the option to clients. If you want me to implement the plan for you, I can open accounts on my end, uh, roll over money and do it all on my end. Or you can take the plan and the recommendations that I'm making and do it yourself. Okay. I didn't know that was an option. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Um, last question, because I want our attendees, la that'll be our last question because we're almost out of time. But you know, I know you have just such a personal experience of why you got into financial services and well, you know, we'll call it as a financial advisor. What, you know, what's your reason that you got into this? Because you're, I mean, I'm going to say you were, I always say you were wise, you were so smart. It's like, and yet you're not 60, 70 years old. <laughs> so let's look at that and go, you have a real person, uh, passion for what you're doing. What's the reason you got into financial services and financial advising? I mean, I'll be completely honest with you. I landed my job at Merrill as a complete accident. Um, <laughs> at the time, I was working as a freelance makeup artist. My dad had just passed away and the money that I was making was not cutting it. And I started applying for jobs, not really knowing what I was getting into. And I think when I started at Merrill, as I learned more was when I realized, wow, like this is this is it. Like, I love it here. I love finance. I love the markets. I love everything about investments. I just, this particular office is not my forever home, which was my reason in leaving that job. I mean, I, I had a very good position there and it was very prominent. My future was very promising. I just, something didn't sit right with me with not being able to be accessible to the average person. And one thing that I questioned management a lot at Merrill was like, okay, if you're telling me that the account minimums are a million dollars, how do people get there without no knowledge or without yeah. any guidance, right? Who's going to get them there? Like, how does this work? And it, I finally got to the point where I thought to myself, I can have a much bigger impact by running a practice the way that I want to. And if I focus on just making an impact in women and being that advisor that I, that women wish to have, the income will come as a byproduct. So that is really my biggest motivator now is that I know the wealth that there is to be made in investing and in financial planning from the client side. And I also know the role that advisors play in that wealth journey. So that's 
pretty, pretty heart centered girl. I love that. <laughs> so we're going to wrap up, but I know you still got your QR code up here. Do you want to share if people want to reach out to you? How do you want them to connect with you? Or is this the best ways to get the financial assessment and then you reach out? What's the best? Yeah. Way? If you want to connect with me, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I am um, on LinkedIn as Tanya Torres uh, CFP. I am also on Instagram, Tanya underscore T. Um, and yeah, my email will be available through the QR code. So if you want to reach out there, um, feel free to. Awesome. Thank you, Tanya. I want to say thank you to being our thought leader today to our attendees and viewers. You know, thank you for joining us as we'll be back again soon with our next women lead webinar series, um, with the focus on how you can lead, achieve and succeed as a better female leader in business. So thanks so much for joining us and everybody stay tuned for our next one. Today was great, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle.